It's sorry for being late, but good evening, everyone, and welcome to the June MAS 2023 general meeting. Love to see everybody's beautiful faces here. I think this is the most we've had in the room in a really long time. So thank you very much for coming. I appreciate that. And we love seeing you. On screen, we have um, compliments of Craig Weinert, the Jellyfish Nebula. So thank you for everybody tonight who submitted photos for me to use with the slide deck. It makes things a lot easier. I think I'm echoing. I own it. I heard it a little bit. I think it was my computer. So sorry, we'll cut that part out. I am Trina Johnson, your MAS president, and we have in the room tonight, John Zimich and Dave Faulkner, who's your vice president and secretary, little mugs up there. Matt Downham is our treasurer and Conrad's here and Ahmed is here. We have a full house. We have a full board. Do we have any voting to do tonight? <laughs> yeah, exactly. I could have a board meeting. <laughs> Hopefully you won't be bored. So this is good. I'm going to change it up tonight, though, and we're going to start off with the treasurer's report and this kind of a little bit of the interim slide deck for my video editor. A big welcome and thank you to our new members, which brings us up to the 794, 95, 795, 695. At some point, we'll be 795 and then I'll just, it'll be great, um, which makes us, I think, one of the bigger leagues in the country. Yeah, yeah. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. Um, so we have 11 new members, uh, which we love adding to our astronomy obsession here. Are there any new members in the room tonight? You just give a big way in the back. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome. And if there are any new members that are online on Zoom tonight, what I want you to do is type in the chat hello or new member, wave your hand, do something, say hello, and everybody else who's online tonight, reply in the chat, welcome and thank you, and greetings. <laughs> um, and since I missed it last month, Mark Job gave us Ro Ophiukai to from Texas for our background slide tonight. So it's it's gorgeous, it's gorgeous. And that's astrophotography, astrophotography for all of you people to add the colors. The rest of us get to see gray fuzzies, which is perfectly fine. As I get a feel for running these meetings, I was thinking of a way to highlight some of our volunteers. And I know for a while there we had a volunteer spotlight and you know, Mark would say a big thank you to everybody. And we have our ELL group, that takes on the task of the public star parties. We have LLCC that does Northern Night Star Fest, uh, CGO that does the Virgo Venture and Messier Marathon. So, if, you know, we have events happening every single year throughout all of our different sites and volunteers that run all of that. So it's a very big thank you to all of those people that um, help with that and along with our outreach events as well. Um, sorry. My screen got small. So anyway, I'll find it here. We got a big one. Yes, that's true. That's true. But my notes are down there. Uh, but I would like a way to highlight the volunteers of our clubs, of our club, who does different things throughout the year for each one, every one of us, which will also do, do like a Q&A to show you how you can volunteer and that it's maybe not as scary as you think, not as much of a time commitment as you think, and just as much fun as you could imagine on how to do that. So next month, I hopefully I will have a volunteer to be my guinea pig to <laughs> do my Q&A to, and um, we'll see how that goes and we'll see if you guys like it or not. And yeah, let me know. You can always email me at president at mnastro.org and let me know how things are going or if you want to see something change. I'm open to reading any emails that you have, especially if somebody wants to volunteer. 
So definitely contact me. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll pick it out of the hat. Um, I don't know if is Anton. Anton is in the house tonight. Welcome back from your trip. Mm -hmm. and he's going to give us a talk about the Lunar Scope program. Okay. As always, members are welcome to borrow one of our 18, soon to be 19 loaner scopes. Um, this is the busy time of the season, so most of them are out right now. But if you wish to request one, go on to our website under membership, loaner scopes, and there's a little form you fill out. You make your request. I receive the request, and then I will contact you within a day and let you know if I can fill it now or if you have to wait a few weeks or whatever, and I will get you your telescope. Um, like right now, I think I have a, um, the binoculars are in, are available. Uh, there's a refractor available. A uh, C6 on a Voyager mount is available. And there's one C8 that's that's currently and everything else. Oh, that's right. And the mead, that's right. Then the, the eight inch mead is there. So we have, there are five of them in right now, but you know, they, they, they come and go all the time. We also have our, our collection of great courses. There we go. Trina put them up there for you. Um, they, not many members have borrowed them, but the few who have said they're really quite good. I, I've watched a couple of them and I've really enjoyed them. Also with Steve's help, we cleared out the storage locker the other day and there's stuff on the back table. If you're into stuff, we've got it for you. Um, there's some finder scopes there and, um, oh, there's an old collection of Sky and Telescope, um, magazines on, on DVD back there. Yeah. And a few other things. So if you'd like to take a look at them after the meeting, please do, because I don't want to take them back. Yeah. Perfect. Thank you. I should hand it that way. Which is another good reason to come in person to the meetings, because then you get to have first dibs at all of the really good stuff. Sometimes it's, mm, but it's, it's a work in progress. So challenge yourself to take something home tonight. That would be great. <laughs> We do have some sky events before the next meeting. Um, this slide is one of those things where I'm not sure if it ever helps you out. So I would like to hear some feedback, whether even if it's in the room right now, whether this helps any of you as we go through, you know, talking about the full moon on the third, you know, last quarter on the 10th. If it helps, raise your hand. Perfect. One. Okay then I will keep doing it. If you have suggestions on how to make this more effective for you, let me know, whether it's in person after the meeting or an email to me. I would really appreciate that because I want to have this meeting be a benefit for you and the new, new members that are coming on to help them as they explore their experience in doing astronomy. It's, it's, it helped me at the beginning because I never knew when the full moon was. I'm like, oh, I'm not gonna go out tonight. I can go do something else. Or new moon, please go out. <laughs> So thank you very much. I appreciate that. And um, I think last month I had some of these wrong. I think I had, instead of May events, I had June events. So this was pretty good. But we're back here on July 6th. Um, so please come join us in person. And we're going to talk about that later. We are still looking for someone to help us with our social media. And um, a little bit of marketing work. If you have any kind of interest, if you're you know, on social media, or I know a lot of us are, but just, it doesn't even have to have a lot of experience, just somebody to kind of help us work through how to explore some options on how to promote our club. Even though we have almost 700 members, we have to have that way of um, keeping, you know, public star parties in front of somebody, whether it's, you know, LinkedIn or, I don't know, Facebook ads, I, I'm, I don't know. <laughs> so we're looking for somebody who might have a little bit of experience with doing some of that. So please let us know, either, you know, talk to anybody on the board, send an email to info at mnastro.org. Um, just give us a shout. We'll, we'll, we'll we want to talk to you. So thank you. Upcoming star parties, which is everybody's favorites. At least I hope it is. We have June 10th and 24th at ELO. Um, Cedar Creek is having one this weekend with our solar observing session. Uh, I believe Cedar Creek is also having a day event. Um, is that right, Mark? Just the solar event? Okay. Okay. All right. Um, I know Cedar Creek is on Instagram, and you can always look them up at their website. 
um, to know a little bit more, but otherwise come on out around one o'clock, Cedar Creek, it's up in East Bethel. Thank you. I always forget. I want to say Hamline, but yes. Yep. Um, I got you, Matt. I will repeat things as people in the audience don't have microphones to share. We could. We could have everybody come up that's talking. Okay, never mind. <laughs> and then we have the BSIG on June 24th. So one second, Suresh. Um, CGO is open for everybody this time of year. The field is dry unless it's raining. Um, the BAD is available and working and can be rolled out of the roof. So thank you, Dick Jacobson, for doing the wheels and getting it all going. So I know he's not here, but maybe he's online. So thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Um, and LLC, LLCC has to, star parties, just watch the forum, but also a note to sign up for Northern Night Star Fest that is out there as well. It's a fun event, dark skies, beautiful time, and you don't have to worry about cooking if you don't want to, because they provide you food as well. You have to pay for it, but they provide you food. And I'm not sure exactly if we have any more uh, key holder training. So just keep an eye on the forums. Um, no, Merle's not in the house tonight. So there we go. Now, Suresh, it's your turn to talk. Hey, everybody. So I know. It was clear this last weekend, right? And a lot of people got out. But before that, who actually got out this year? Did anybody get out this year? A couple of people? Well, we had two BSIG events scheduled, and both of them got clouded out. One was at the end of April, and one was uh, about two weeks later, in the middle of May. So I apologize for that. But we do have a BSIG event, a beginner special group, special interest group event coming up on June 24th. We couldn't do it later this month because of the holiday, uh, at the end of May, I should say. So the next one will be scheduled for the 24th at Metcalf Field. I also want to make a plug for Metcalf Field since it is usable for members. It is, it is available on these, for, especially for people on the east side. It's not the darkest site, but it's very secluded and it's open. I think it's 24 seven, am I right? For, for all members to use. So if you have, if you live on that side of town, it's actually very convenient. So uh, hopefully you guys can come out uh, to the BSIG. And if you want to help out, uh, please let me know. Um, I can be found. There we go. Now I'm on. Yep, I think with the B SIG, the field, if you find the gate, the gate is just closed. There's no lock on it. So you just have to open it up. It's kind of a deterrent for people just driving in and, and messing around. So and then we have Friday for the backup, correct? Okay. Yep. And now for our public service announcements. Um, Clayton is available to give us a little bit of a rundown with a microphone for Franconia. Um, yeah. Uh, hello, guys. Uh, one more quick thing. Uh, another announcement on Franconia uh, Sculpture Park. They're having their solstice event on the 17th. That's a Saturday. And they've invited uh, MAS or MAS members to come to have a star party from 10 p.m. to 12. We'll probably run a little bit later than that. Their activities at their park, which... You can go on their website and take a look at what they're doing, um, but they'll have like a solstice um, celebration, I guess, um, or maybe a maypole. I'm not a maypole, but they'll have a, they're going to have a bonfire, hopefully far from us. Uh, they're going to have uh, a few um, uh, events around uh, the art show itself and the, the, art, the artists that are in residence at that facility. So if you're interested in coming, let me know. My name is... Uh, my email is up there. Uh, that is so that we can give them a count of how many people are arriving, and I can share with you where we can park and where we can set up. So if you're doing solar, you probably don't need to arrive before 5 p.m. That's around that time. Uh, if uh, you're doing just nighttime observing, um, we won't officially start until 10 p.m. Of course, it'll be barely dark at 10 p.m., uh, but, uh, so you can arrive relatively late for that also. But again, if you are thinking about coming, just give me, uh, a small email so I can reply back the details. So thank Excellent. you. Thank you, Clayton. And the daytime event for them, is that free to people or is that? It's 40, but it's a 
$10. Okay. Okay, free but possible $10 parking fee. All right, and then I know that Ahmed posted on the forums in Slack about the astronomy astrophotography meeting, which we are having in August. So please send him the through the board member one at mnastro.org email his um, your astrophotography or Milky Way from DSLR or your cell phone cameras or cell phone images of the Northern Lights. Anything counts as far as it's photography for astronomy. Any questions about that? Okay. All right. What? Bottom item. Somebody caught the bottom item, which is the eclipse countdown. Um, hopefully, I'm uh, pretty accurate on the days. I asked my Google phone last night how many days to you know October and April, and I took one off because this is current for today. So 135 days from now, there's the annular eclipse on October 14th, and I'm not sure where, I don't know if that counts for Minnesota. Nope. Okay. I'll figure that out next time as it gets closer. And then, and then 312 days to the so, total solar eclipse on April 8th. We can have partials in Minnesota, definitely. So if you can't go someplace, please step outside and look up safely with the sun no you know unprotected viewing please I, if you do i don't want to hear about it later because i warned you and as antone said there are items in the back of the room i don't think i got the pictures up so we do have a grinding is it the mirror polishing and the grinding tools are those with tonight do you want to talk a little bit about that i don't Is it on? It's on. Okay. Um, yeah, when we were cleaning out the stuff in the loaner storage, there's a really interesting looking uh uh mirror grinding machine. It's a it's a metal one. It's not not a mirromatic because I think I've seen those things that are homemade uh wooden ones, but it's a pretty interesting collection of gears and pulleys and stuff in a dish. Looks like it's probably good for grinding up to an eight-inch mirror. And in addition to that, we have uh, several other things. We have uh, an eight-inch, yeah, an eight-inch uh, plate glass tool, not the mirror, but the tool, the glass tool. We have a six-inch tool and mirror as a package. We also have uh, somebody put together some big aluminum discs. One's an eight-inch disc, one's a 10-inch disc, I think, and then a four and a three brass dish. Um, uh plates that that you can put pitch on to do that and then we have pitch and there's a uh it's a thing of google's number 64 pitch i don't know the numbers of the put pitch so hopefully that's the right one and also um there's a box that has some grit in it i didn't inventory the grit but anyway it's all free it's uh all still sitting up there so we can uh work out a way to get it to you if you if you want that yeah and if you want oh. pictures we can send it out too Shresh? Ron, you want to talk to that? It's to Rush was asking if the Eisenhower part of grinding mirrors and other. Hey, 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 and, uh, for the for the for the audience out there, Shresh. Hold on. For Hold the on. audience out there, Shresh is asking about the Eisenhower uh, mirror coder. Okay, so we've got a mirror coder, vapor coder that we can use. Uh, we can code up to a sixteen-inch mirror underneath that bell jar. And uh, we've had some challenges this year with the space, uh, new management, new administration has pretty much tossed us under the bus. Wait, is this going on on the internet? Yes. So we've had some challenges, <laughs> but we're working through them, co-effectively synergizing a win-win solution. Great job, Ron. Yeah. Softly. So we've got one coming up. Uh, contact me um, all over on the forums, uh, Mike Kibbett has been rattling our cage trying to get his mirrors uh coated um strip the coating bring it in blank and we can code it for you now if you just want to do it because your mirror is dirty 
eh, not so much. Okay. You can clean your mirror. It works out fine. And if your mirror is dirty, you know what? You might need to not even have to clean it. Your mirror can put up with a lot of dust before it impacts your observing but, quality. But it Ron, really can. No, but, no, nothing from you, El Presidente. I have the conch. Okay. So clean first, complain later. And then if you really have to say there's scratches on it, say it's all oxidized, bring it in. We can coat it up. We do ask for a $40 donation for each coater run because that stuff's not cheap. There's exotic oils and tubes in that thing that we've been trying to keep running since 1968. Um, it was originally over at EW and Optical, and they brought it over to McAllister for uh, Dr. Schultz to do his mirror coating. And they were going to toss it out. It was sitting on the dock. We grabbed it off the dock, and it's got a home up at Eisenhower. Eisenhower Community Center, it's got the telescope up there from 1955 when they built the high school. And again, our public program has been impacted. The aforementioned working things out. I probably won't be able to have any open nights till uh, the fall, but we will have nights to work on mirrors by appointment only. So let me know if you need. Sure. I'm sorry, any questions? Yes, you in the front. <laughs> I have a question. What if I take my mirror and I look from the backside to the front and I can see through it? Is that a problem for viewing or? It might be. It okay. might be. That so... talks to the efficiency of the coating. If the coating is too thin that you can see through it, you are losing light through the coating. Would that be because I touched it and rubbed all the dust off of it? Yes, I could help. Okay. Well, good. Uh, that stuff's only that. a couple atoms thick, so <laughs> okay. don't get aggressive. I, no, definitely not. Right? That's it's, not me. Yeah, now. it's not your dishes. No. All right. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Anything online? How about from Slack? Let's check the boards. From Slack? No, nothing trending. Okay. All right. Just let me know. And, and, and great commentary. And I have Thank seen you. Karina's mirror, and I can attest that it definitely needs recoding. And only, and not only can you see through it, but the front surface of it is, uh, yeah, uh, a little rather oxidized. Dull, rather mm -hmm. dull. Yes, yes, definitely. I would like to see my stars sharp and clear and bright. <laughs> like my dishes, yes. <laughs> Who are those new members tonight? This is normal between me and Ron, so don't worry. It's perfectly fine. But for those other members <laughs> that need to have a badge to know who we are, at the back of the room, there are forms to fill out to get your said badge with your name and whatever else you want on it. Uh, but just don't ask Chris double-sided. He won't do that. And I think, I don't know if there are any more for sale items in the back of the room. I don't know. We'll find out. And on to a quick presentation side note on the MAS site reservation training that happened last month, which we have been using for a little while. We're going to get an update from Ahmed. Thank you, Trina, and thanks everybody for your patience as we work through this to get the reservation site up and running. But pretty much what happened was we started the pilot, we had issues, we had to reprogram the entire site. Many thanks to Vaults for taking that on. And what I'm gonna go through today is just high level how it works. It's pretty simple, straightforward. And by the way, this uh, slide deck has been already posted to each of the key holder forums. So you'll be able to find it there in addition to the password to access the reservation calendar for each specific site. So pretty much um, to access the calendars, go to the website under facilities, you drop down and you highlight the facility, it will show you, hey, this is the reservation calendar as you can see here. So it's pretty straightforward through the website, you can access it on your phone or on a PC at home. And then pretty much, as we said, these guidelines, you know, any key holder in good standing can use that. We, they have their access to the form, they get the password, and then they can use that calendar. And pretty much this is only for reserving telescopes. If you're out there to set up on the patio and take images with your own equipment, you do not need to use this, um, you do not need to use this calendar. And then also, um, um, as I said, this is for active key holders. You'll find the password on the forum. And when you book this, you'll get an email notification that you should, you know, you should actually accept that and save it so it reminds you. And it will send out two email notifications. 
one upon making the reservation and one two days before the reservation comes up just to remind you hey you've reserved that and if you've did it if you've done the reservation within 48 hours you'll get two emails right away and then when you uh, reserve you know an asset a telescope you're responsible for updating your reservation if you need to cancel we'll go through the steps for that but pretty much make sure that if you're not going to go out there and you've booked something go and update it and make it available for others to use it and then um, just when you're out there follow the site operation guidance and, and rules and checklists and pretty much if there is going to be a work party that day they don't need to book uh, that facility they'll be actually working during the day getting things done and your reservation um, will cover from 8 p.m. on the day of the reservation through 8 a.m. Sorry, from 4 p.m. to 8 a.m. the next day in the morning. So you have access to that asset. And then, you know, work party volunteers will take care of cleaning and everything. So hopefully the facility is always ready for you to use whenever you make a reservation, whether for personal use or outreach or whatever you're doing out there. So pretty much, you know, fall checklists and you know, just looking at the reservation calendar, this is what it looks like. There is the page out there. This is what it looks like. And if you hover over any of the reservations, it will show you who made the reservation. You know, it will show you their contact information. And you should actually reach out to them if you're going to be out there or if you're wondering, hey, you know, come, can I come and tag along? You know, we're a club. We all work together and, uh, and have fun together. So don't hesitate to reach out to people. And pretty much uh, the way you do the reservation is you don't need to worry about club sponsored events like star parties or astronomy days or any of that, because we've already blocked all these days. So the days that it's showing green, those are the days available for you to go out there and book them. And uh, you know, your phone. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yes. So, so, um, you know, you, this is pretty much the, the view that you have. You pick the day, you know, you pick the month, you pick the day, and you pick the two, the piece of equipment that you need. So you can do like an ELO visual platform or, or, you know, here we selected, you know, Sylvia Casby. Pick the month, pick the day, and then pretty much fill out your information. And then when you hit submit booking, that's it. So there isn't, there isn't much to it. And then you will show up on the reservation calendar now for others to see, hey, I booked this at this time. And, you know, this asset is not available. It's pretty straightforward, as I said. One page, one, you know, we fill out the information, select the time, and then just submit booking. And then, so yeah, these are just the steps here. Quickly, yeah, select asset, select date, and then you fill out your information and then submit booking. Now, this is just a sample of the email that you'll be getting. You have an ICS file that you can open and save to your calendar. So your phone can remind you or a computer can remind you of your reservation. And then finally, last but not least, for cancellations or questions, we've created a form. If you want to make a cancellation, you need to go fill out that form. Make sure you fill out the reservation date that you want to cancel, and it will be taken care of within 48 hours. Sounds good. And if you have any suggestions or any questions, you can use that and just leave the reservation date null. Any questions so far? For questions, you can always email us at scheduling at mnastra.org. Okay, go ahead, Ron. The question is, does the reservation, does the reservation do a unique number for it? I'm not getting the question. You're saying a unique number. Yeah. So in the text, you can actually say what you've reserved. Yeah. So I think what you what you're asking is when you get that reservation, it'll say your date, your site, your telescope information all of that to know that it's that's the one that you selected I get that. yeah it does give you a unique uh, reservation number <laughs> oh my god vaults <laughs> thanks vaults does that answer your question Ron? 
<laughs> so <I'm> good. <laughs> it's good to have you on here, Ron. Any other questions? Any questions online? Yep. Mad. So back of the room. That you do not need to have a reservation for. Anything out anything outside the observatory at Cherry Grove is fully to be used. And the warming house, as long as you have been trained in the warming house, you can access it. If you're only going out there to use the field, fine. No reservation needed. Um, not even on busy nights. The only time that you need to have that reservation is if you're wanting the BAD, the LX200, or under the separate reservation site for the imaging rig. So that way no, somebody doesn't overbook and both of you come down there and go want to fight. You don't need a reservation for it. You, you have to get trained as a key holder at CGO. Yes. Yep. yep. Sorry. Yeah, you can use the reservation calendar, but if you don't have access code to any of the sites as a key holder, this is useless. So you got to be a key holder first, and then you can use this. Right. So and for that. CGO key holders with access to the imaging, which is separate. And for the other parts, just email um, mas-cgo.com, or sorry, at mnastro.org because I don't have all of the key holders into the key holder forum because that was not something that we had used in previous years. So it's still getting updated. No, you don't need to be a key holder to use the plaza at ELO. That's for member access. Yeah, any member can use it. If you wanna use the telescopes and use the facilities or gain access to the facility, you gotta be a key holder. All right. Any cool. other questions? CGO training, you guys going to be on anywhere? No, CGO training for key holdership is on the forums. And we will post on there, which we did one last at the Virgo Venture. You were at LLCC. Okay. Sorry, Seahold. What? What? Oh. Uh, yeah, still the forums. Forums is the best place to go for looking for keyholder training. And it's usually under the main discussion area of the forums for whatever site you're you're wanting to get uh, trained at. Anything else will be restricted unless you're on a special list to have access. Does that answer your question? Okay. Any other questions? So at this point, is there any um no, we don't have anything for LLCC. This is for CGO, JJC, and L uh, ELO. For, for the two large telescopes at LLCC, you're going to have to reach out to the coordinator over there. So, okay. So, uh, pretty much, um, pretty much from an implementation standpoint, we are calling today as the last day of the pilot. So, move because We've been using this and, you know, many thanks today for actually sending it out in email a couple of weeks back. We've been having a lot of reservations. We've had over 40 of them. People have been using it, creating, you know, creating stuff, making reservations and canceling and, and using it actively. And we haven't had any technical issues or any feedback. Things seem to be marching smoothly. So we're pretty much going live with this. And pretty much so for reserving equipment in the past, you had to post on the forum for reserving that equipment. Moving forward, you don't post on the forum, you have to use the reservation calendar. Sounds good. This is the way to book things and gain access to them. And if you have made a reservation on the forum, I've checked as of this morning, we've already reflected everything that's been on the forum in the past. Go ahead, Merle. Okay, that's a specific rule for ELO. So, yeah. So what, what Merle is saying is that for ELO, he has a specific rule that he requires that um, if you're going to be out at ELO, you need to post on the forum in addition to using this calendar. Are we good, Merle? 
Sounds good. So now yeah. that doesn't stop you from posting on the form that you're going to be going out that night. Yeah. So you can still do it if you want to. Yeah. We're just asking you to also, if you're specifically asking for a particular um, equipment, to use the reservation calendar. So. Yeah. This this is officially going to be the record. Who's got booked what, and and when, so that they gain access to it. And it's a first come first serve basis mm -hmm. kind of a deal, so that we don't have. We've had in the past where you can book something on the forum three months in advance, but then you know a couple of weeks before somebody will go and book on the same day, same night, and they haven't checked the history, and then you have a conflict. This way, actually, we wouldn't have that issue. So, go ahead, Suresh. Correct. Yeah. Correct. At, at JJC. If you reserve the 10-inch the TMB, you reserve that in the observatory. The plaza is still open for everybody to use. And you can also put in your notes that you're going to be out there, but plaza is free. Please come on out. Yep. Um, so that way, anybody who's checking the reservation calendar can see that as well. That's what those comment sections are for. There is an entry for the uh, JJC plaza, but it's kind of an optional thing just as a post as a courtesy for others. Vaults, would that take care of multiple people wanting to use the plaza since there's three or four spots? Right. That's that's exactly right. Because um, it's, it's so if a group of 10 people go out there, then then you know that there's 10 people there. So there's no definitely not being for 11. So uh, people would know. But it's it's not a requirement. It's it's kind of a more of a suggestion. OK. All right. Thank you for that. OK, any last questions? If you have any questions, send them to scheduling at mnastro.org, or you can reach out to Vaults and I directly. You know, we're around, we're available. Thank you all. Perfect. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Ahmed. Go ahead. Um, as a plug, we have the Gemini that's going to be coming out, hopefully shortly, I believe. It's been published. It's been published. Excellent. Excellent. But I know Father Brown is always looking for articles. Um, about your adventures, uh, technical items, anything that you want to post about that's astronomy related um, of some sort. And um, I, the deadline, I think, is the next one is July 10th for the Gemini that gets published in August. It's a little weird because he needs to have time to coordinate all the articles and get it all set up. So um, just send it on out to him and he'll he'll take care of it. Which brings us to the happenings, which Dave sends out wonderfully. Um, but if you do have an event like the Franconia Sculpture Park event, um, send it to Dave at secretary at mnastro.org, and he will get it published. Hmm? The mi microphone. Oh, Dave, you want to talk about it? It's on. So, uh, oh, there you go. Yes. So Do you want to come up in front and see in uh, part of the camera? Yeah, fine, okay. Please, thank you. People at home don't like they like to see faces. I know, I know. Okay. Uh okay, yeah. So the, the happenings comes out uh once a week. Uh a lot of times I'll get notifications of an upcoming event, like the like the, the Franconia Sculpture Park, for instance. And I got that probably two, three weeks ago. However, I, I just want you to know that my policy is that it's the happenings this week. So uh, I will not publish it until the week of the actual event. So if you send me something that you want published, that you want, uh, you know, in the happenings, happy to do it, but you won't see it until the week that it's going to happen. Let's say that. And yes, the the new the new Gemini just came out hot off the press, and I have published it to the website. So we're good. Excellent. Thank you. And in a, if you want to sign up for the hap the MAS happenings. Well, if you want, to, yeah. So if you want to, for, first of all, if you're a member, you should already be in there because Steve sends me the list every month, and I go ahead and, and import those names into the happenings. Uh, but if you want to uh, sign up separately, if you're not a member but you want to, but you want to get the happenings, uh, you can. Um, how do they do that? Yes, exactly. I had to look it up. You. It's on the screen. Guess what? You go to the email happenings uh, email announcement section of the beginners page oh. on the website. Down here. Yes. Okay. So, the very it's, bottom there. so it's okay. right on the, on the home page. Go. Beginners or about beginners. Scroll a little way down on your right hand side. Look for that. Put in your name and email and we'll 
Get you on the list. And it, and it comes into the secretary mailbox and I go ahead and update the list. So that's good. Perfect. Cool. Just like clockwork. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Dave. And now we are to, I think, the favorite part of our night. I always enjoy seeing all these, especially when Jerry is in the house. So yay, Jerry. To do the Astronomical League Awards. Good evening, and ladies and gentlemen. My name is Jerry Jones and I have the pleasure of being the Astronomical League Coordinator for the Minnesota Astronomical Society. We have a glitch in the room, thanks to Ron and Mark. Are you guys going to behave? Are you going to behave? It's just a yes or a no question. Are you going to behave? You can't. Okay, I'll go on anyway. So my, it is my pleasure to be to uh, coordinate and organize the awards that are created and uh, and arranged by the Astronomical League. Something which I will talk more specifically about next month so those especially those of you who are new you'll get a better idea of just what the awards are we happen to have one member of our of our mas who is not here at the moment dave tostison who has completed another award he's been a busy boy he's completed i don't know eight or ten thousand in the last couple of months um, and the uh, the next one that he has the most recent one that he has completed is the urban project and this is a this is a um, observing project that you can do and you need to do under situations where you cannot see the milky way so any place in in our twin cities area is is a go for this so congratulations dave tostison on uh, gaining the urban award Excellent. and more on that next next month, month. yes mark job did yes go ahead you did say you can't help it go ahead okay So the question is, can we do this, the urban awards, in a place for And the answer to that question, as I understand the most recent ruling, is yes. So the can issue is, can you see the Milky Way? If you cannot see it, then you are allowed to do the urban. Cool. Cool. But sad. Correct. That is correct. With the Urban Award, you that have to not be able to see the Milky Way. In order and I would to prefer not to be pressed any farther because then I have to use names to be able to tell you why. If you can see the Milky Way, you cannot do this one. You can't do this one. You can't do this one. You cannot do this one. If you can't see the Milky Way, you can do this one. If you can't see the Milky Way, you can do the urban project. Look it up on astroleague.org org under urban. And I'll be back, I think, in a minute, right? <laughs> you, you forgot your famous line. Oh. oh, my God. Can't go anywhere without this. And after all of that, get out there and observe. <laughs> I don't want the microphone. I got my own. Speaking of getting out there and observing, I am looking for a volunteer for Better Know a Constellation or any kind of presentation <laughs> that is related to the constellations or the night sky for at least September. But this time around, we are going to hear from Alan about telescopium, right? All right. Hey, I got it right. I forgot. I could read the next slide. So guess what? He gets that. Thank you very much. So, okay. Yeah, and to go, okay. And the other way to go back. Ooh, wow. Ah, amazing. So telescopium is a constellation that ought to be really, really important for all of us amateur astronomers. You know, I mean, after all, it is the telescope. 
Um, in French, it's the telescope. <laughs> He's French. Um, uh, <laughs> good question. So this was uh, one of uh, 14 constellations, I'll talk about them later, that were defined by the Frenchman Nicolas Louis de la Caille uh, in 1750 to 1754 when he traveled down to Cape Town. And he had it pretty big, and then the International Astronomical Union redefined it and made it a lot smaller. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> Those IAU guys eliminate stuff. So, so Telescopium is the is the fifty seventh largest constellation. For thus, for those of us in the northern hemisphere that can't see it, it's very very similar to Ursa Minor. So, if you look at Ursa Minor in the sky, the little dipper um, Telescopium is really similar in size to it. Um, it's it's rectangular. So, if you're thinking in spherical coordinates, it's a rectangular constellation. So spherical coordinates, rectangular means it's got curves. Um, and they defined it in terms of right ascension and declination. So it actually is this nice rectangle across the sky. And you can see it's right below Corona Australis. And Scorpius is there, Sagittarius is above it, Microscopium is to the left. From Minnesota, we can, if you're really, really lucky, you can see Corona Australis. Hmm. Has anybody here ever seen Corona Australis from Minnesota? Okay, there's a few people. Suresh, of course, Suresh has seen it from Minnesota, right? Yeah, okay. And uh, so telescopium is just under the horizon from that. So we need something that can see through the Earth to be able to, to get the telescopium from here. Or you got to go travel. So uh, again, Nicola Louis de la Caille. I spent some time researching how to say that because otherwise I wouldn't have had a clue. Um, uh, set up his observatory on the shores of Table Bay on the Atlantic coast right near Cape Town, South Africa, what is now Cape Town, South Africa. And Table Mountain, which is right near there, is a really great observing spot. You're up quite a ways above the sea level, great observing spot, but he would have had to haul all this stuff up there. There's nothing up there. None of the supplies are up there. And back in 1750, there wasn't a lot of light pollution or anything. So he said, I'm going to make it easy so I can be to the town, go to restaurants, you know, eat fine French food, all that good stuff, and just set up the observatory right by the shore, Table Bay. And Table Bay is circled in the, uh, in the red circle there. Um, I'm going to pause briefly while I walk over and get my bottle of water that I forgot to bring with me. Otherwise, I'll get more and more croaky as this goes on. Yeah, yeah, we're singing later. Yeah. Um, so uh, uh, Delacai was actually quite the accomplished mathematician and surveyor. And uh, while he was down there, he surveyed 10,000 stars, the positions of 10,000 stars in, in his four years down there. Uh, really, most of his observing was in a two-year period. He was using a half-inch refractor. I said, what are we talking about? A half inch refractor for this? This is after the time of Newton. <laughs> yeah, we have finder scopes back there that are bigger than the refractor he was using. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Um, yeah, when you bring that up here and I'll show the folks online something that's like a two inch refractor. So, you know, like here's here's a two inch refractor, and he was using something that was a half inch. So I figured that was a misprint. I went and checked. They've got a source for it, you know, in Wikipedia. It's actually indexed to a university research paper that he was using a half inch refractor. So it's like 10,000 stars, their accurate positions with a half inch refractor, surveyed 42 nebulous regions across the southern skies measured the parallaxes of the sun and moon using Mars. So parallax is the angle that uh, to measure distance gives you the side the angle of a triangle and defined 14 constellations. So, uh, and also went and did a ground survey to set up and measured the, uh, a ground survey so that he could 
look at the radius of the earth in the southern hemisphere and compare the radius of the earth in the southern hemisphere to the radius of the earth in the northern hemisphere. And it turned out he messed that one up a little bit because he forgot to take into account the change in the gravity vector due to the mass of Table Mountain that was right there. So a hundred or so years later, they realized that the gravity vector shifted a little bit, so his measurements were a little off. So this is, you know, a picture that, that Wikipedia has for Nicola Louis de la Caille. Um, he had a pretty short life from 1713 to 1762. Um, he kind of uh, calculated himself to death, one of the references said. He was so busy working, he didn't take care of himself, and he just calculated himself into oblivion. Um, so in his, in his studies, he studied rhetoric and philosophy and theology, but he didn't become an ordained priest. He became an abbey because he wanted to, or an abbot, because uh, he wanted to focus on science. And so he did a coastal survey of France from Nantes to Bayonne. He measured the French meridian arc, uh, looking at the size of the earth, uh, defined basis for surveys in France. Um, just an outstanding mathematician. So uh, he published his findings with uh, 400 bright stars, corrected for aberration and nutation, all done by hand-cranked math back in the 1750s. Um, and he actually carried out the calculations on comet orbits and was responsible for actually naming Halley's Comet. Even though Halley worked out the math and the orbital elements and things, de la Caille actually named the comet for Halley. We had a, a, a guy at work found a problem, you know, and, and solved a problem for us. And, and so we, we, called, uh, we called the problem Rory's blanking blob. <laughs> and he objected to that and says, you know, hey, I didn't create the thing. My immediate response was, Halley didn't create the comet. So here is Le Telescope as seen in the program Sky Safari. So it's kind of on edge, and the objective end of the refractor is made up with alpha telescopy eye, and the eyepiece end of the telescope is made up with zeta telescopy eye, and sigma telescopy eye is kind of where the mount would be, but not exactly, and the rest of it is just completely made up. <laughs> so. So there's just not a lot there. So there's really no legends to talk about. You know, there's no legends of, of Perseus and legends of Cassiopeia and all these great Greek things. This is the telescope. Yeah, yeah. So, you know, the telescoping is obviously for amateur astronomers the most important constellation that he did. But this was the age of enlightenment where people were looking at science instruments and things. So he did Ant Antlia, the air pump, Calum, the engraver's chisel, Circinus, the drafter's compass. So like the thing where you're, you know, doing geometry in school, that's the, that's the constellation Circinus. Fornax, the chemist's furnace, Horologium, the pendulum clock. I like clocks. Um, so I'm, I'm, a, I'm a fan of Horologium. I've never seen it that I know of, even though I've been in the, the Southern Hemisphere. Um, Mensa, which is a table. Not Mensa, the Association of Brilliant People, but a table. And it's a reference to Table Mountain, near where he was doing all of his Southern Hemisphere observing. Um, microscopium, Norma, Octans, Pictor, Pixis, Reticulum. So, you know, this... This scope here has a nice uh, crosshairs in it. It's kind of like a reticle. <laughs> so a lot of us have microguide eyepieces that have reticles in them. So reticulum is that constellation for the microguide eyepiece. And lastly, sculptor, which is self-defined as a, or a sculptor making a sculpture. So there's, there's 14 constellations that he put together and kept around. So what are the tractions? What are the really fascinating things in telescopium? Well, there's a globular cluster. <laughs> there's uh, several index catalog items, two of which are non-existent.
There's other things. There's low 18. Has anybody ever heard of the low catalog? L-O-18? Yeah, low priority. There we go. Um, Mama Jack 4. Ooh. Another catalog I've never even heard of. Has anybody heard of Mama Jack? No. Um, ESO, European Southern Observatory 231-30, which is a globular cluster. And then there's Dark Nebula with definitions of IREC, I-R-E-C. That's another one. I couldn't find any list of an astronomical catalog, I-R-E-C. So I'm thinking it's something in infrared. Uh, it was infra found in infrared, and the dust is thick enough to block infrared transmission. So I'm thinking it's an infrared dark nebula. But I really don't know. So if anybody knows what the heck an IREC catalog number is, let me know. Send me an email. You know, let somebody here know. And lastly, there's a DIR, another catalog I haven't got a clue about and couldn't find any references for. I went and looked at lists of astronomical catalogs. These guys aren't in there. <laughs> Yet Sky Safari seems to find them and point them out. Um, anyway, those are kind of the deep sky things. So for your deep sky aficionados, these are the non-galactic deep sky things in the Constellation Telescopium. Galaxies. There's all kinds of galaxies inside Telescopium. So there's the Telescopium Grus cloud of galaxies. Um, it's a galaxy filament that runs through a number of southern constellations. And there's uh, uh, Brent Tully's, another astronomer, fairly recent, that uh, put together with Richard Fisher this uh, uh, nearby galaxies atlas. And so he's got a nearby galaxies catalog. And so the NBGC 61-1 galaxy group and 61-4 group of nearby galaxies are in telescopium. And if I go back to, uh, uh, to Starry Night, or sorry, sorry, uh, Sky Safari, what you see is this is the clusters of galaxies that are there with all the PGC galaxies that are back in there. And the one, the three things that are highlighted in blue, there's one in the top left, and there's two kind of in the bottom center part. Those are the heart or the brightest members of those two galaxy groups. So if you want to go look for galaxy groups, Telescopium is a great place to look for that. But if I just set it for magnitude 14 and brighter, they've basically all here. So, you know, from being, you know, something that amateur astronomers should be really fascinated with, this constellation is, frankly, a dud. So stars, we'll get to the last part here. Uh, stars, um, the Bayer system, assigning Greek letters. Uh, Nicola Louis de la had a number of stars there. Uh, Alpha is the brightest, Alpha Telescopii. It's the objective lens, the brightest star, about magnitude 3.5. Um, uh, it's quite a bit brighter than the sun. Um, you know, blue, subgiant, uh, you know, B3 subgiant. Um, Zeta is the other one at the other end, it's 4.1, and everything gets dimmer from there. Um, beta telescope I is gone. That was ruled out by the IAU and went back to being Eta Sagittarii. Eta Sagittarii, sorry. Gamma telescope I became G Scorpii, Scorpii, and Theta became D Ophiuchi, lowercase d Ophiuchi even. So it went from being something major to get a Greek letter in the Bayer system to getting a lowercase letter in Ophiuchi. And so Corona Australis uh, also you know, uh, picked up that star, the last star, became an HR star, didn't even warrant a letter. But by far the most important star in telescopium, it's the one that's absolutely critical for amateur astronomers and amateur astronomers love this star in telescopium. It's absolutely incredible. It is new telescopii because we all want new telescopii in our possession. <laughs> and what's even better is new telescopii has a little companion it's magnitude 9.3, 102 arc seconds, 330 degree position angle. 
And that little companion, I would suggest, should really be new guide scope EI or new finder scope EI. <laughs> so that's really the summary of telescopium, a constellation that ought to be really important, but in point of fact, is pretty much a dud. Thank you, Alan. Wonderfully enlightening with its deadliness. <laughs> we double as a comedy club here, by the way. <laughs> and we have just one final tidbit before we have our guest speaker come on tonight. Um, the next meeting is July 6th, um, a very important month, and right before my birthday. So. Please come and join me. I might even bring birthday cupcakes. Yes, maybe, maybe. We'll see. We'll see how busy I am. Um, but we're going to meet here in person. So one of the um, requests that we've been getting is to fill up this room. It's a beautiful room. It's huge comparatively to the other room, if, if some of you don't know it. And we have two parts of it. So. Here's one part. Here's the other part. Say hello. Thank you. So we are going to give this a shot. We're not going to have a Zoom meeting next month. It's only in person. So we need to have you come here and see us face to face. See our comedy group, if such people will come and attend, and bring your stuff to swap. Bring your stuff to sell and bring money to buy maybe lanyards next time or coffee bugs as such. Um, and give us a shout. You know, directions are on the website. So we're going to kind of give, give you uh, options to show up. It's okay. I was getting to it. We're going to do in person because of the good months that everybody can drive around and hopefully be mobile and not stuck in snow. So from April to October, so April 1st meeting, October 1st meeting, or whatever that may be, we're going to be here in person. November through March for the winter months, we're going to be hybrid. So we're still going to be here. We're still going to be on Zoom. And it's all going to be recorded. It's all going to be posted on the YouTube channel. Um, and we want your feedback. So MAS dashboard, send us an email. Yes, Mark. Yes. Okay. Thank you for your input. True. There, there might be that and there might be some considerations. Right. But we still have our speakers, Zoom speakers, that are going to be online. So this is how it's going to be recorded and be posted on the um, YouTube channel. So just kind of sit with that for a little bit and think about it and maybe make some plans. And we'll see how this goes. If it is a complete flop, we'll go from there too. All right. So now that I've dropped the bombshell on you all. I would like to invite our speaker tonight to come up. He is here, right? Yep, Mr. Professor Frank Kutzler. Did I get that right? Kutzler, all right, all right. Um, all right, all right, sorry for the delay. Uh, sorry for the delay. Um, I, I read the other day that by the time you reach age 70, which is my age, you've lost about uh, 20 to 25% of your brain, it's atrophied. So uh, that has nothing to do with what I'm talking about tonight, but I hope you'll keep that in mind as you evaluate uh, this. My topic is uh, nuclear, stellar nucleosynthesis, how stars form elements. Um, if that's not particularly interesting to you, don't despair because I'm not very good at sticking to a topic. So I'm gonna take off on a flight of fancy at one point which involves, well, puppies and kitties. So um, there's, there's that. 
My name is Frank Kutzler. I am not currently a professor. I was a professor at one time uh, from 1985 to 2000, but I was a professor of chemistry, not astronomy and physics. Um, chemistry was my second love. Astronomy has always been my first love. At the time I had the decision to make, I did not really think the job market was going to be that good for uh, astronomy, so I went into chemistry and I'll always wonder if about that road not taken. Uh, I taught at Tennessee Technological University, which is a public university in Tennessee. If you've heard about the Tennessee State Legislature in the last few weeks, you'll understand that I was not happy having my financial future associated with that group of people. So at a certain point, I left. In 2000, I left, became a software developer. Uh, 2003, I moved up here to Minneapolis and I've worked mostly as a contractor at various places around town, Blue Cross, the Minneapolis Federal Reserve, and I retired from Best Buy in uh, 2018. And I've been a lifelong space nerd. When I was five years old, I was standing out in my front lawn in Pueblo, Colorado, looking up at the sky at a small point of light that was going crawling across the sky, and they told me that was a Russian satellite. And I was just fascinated by the idea that you could put something up there that would go completely around the world in 90 minutes. And I became fascinated with it. When I realized that the, that the world wasn't a big black bull over us, but that blackness was a gigantic, almost infinite sea of absolutely beautiful things, I just fell in love. And the more I loved it, the more I read about it, the more I read about it, the more I loved it. And so that's been uh, going on for quite a while. Now, I'm not a, I do not do research in astronomy, so I'm gonna have to rely on uh, those who do. The Great Courses has several uh, great uh, astronomy courses, and I think the best one is the cosmology, the history and nature of our universe. By the way, I think that was on the disks that you mentioned earlier. I, I think I picked it out of that. This is uh, by Dr. Mark Whittle at the University of Virginia, an absolutely superb uh, rendition of virtually everything cosmological. And I'm, I'm relying to a great extent on his work here, and I really appreciate him for that. Well, this is what we're trying to explain. Periodic table of the elements, this is everything that we see, touch, hear, feel, taste, it's all there. How did it all come about? Let's talk a little bit about vocabulary. Uh, I'm sure you realize that atoms are uh, have a very tiny nucleus, about 10 to the minus 15th meters across, with electrons that are doing something around it. Electrons are very strange objects. We don't really, well, I don't really understand them, even though that was what I was focusing on as a chemist. As a chemist, I had everything to do with those electrons, nothing to do with the nucleus. Now I'm just going to be just the opposite of that. The nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. Together, they're considered nucleons. So we use that as a uh, catch-all term for the uh, objects in the nucleus. To specify a nucleus, we uh, use something along these lines. The Fe is uh, the chemical symbol for iron, the Latin ferrum. And an important number is the mass number. That's the total number of nucleons in the nucleus, the total number of protons and neutrons. This 26 is the number of protons, which is sometimes emitted because it's not really necessary. If it's iron, it has exactly 26 protons. If it doesn't have exactly 26 protons, it's not iron. So that's sometimes omitted. So we say iron 56 is a nuclide of iron. Um, it also has four other nuclides or isotopes, which are stable. Um, many elements have more than one stable isotope. Iron is one of them. If, they're, if the isotopes are not stable, they undergo some sort of radioactive decay. Well, this is um, our first experimental value. We have along the x-axis the number of protons in the nuclei of the elements we see up there. And this is the abundances of these things. So on the, on the y-axis, notice that we're a, on an exponential scale. From here to here is a factor of 100. 
here to here is a factor of another 100. So there's a tremendous uh, uh, variation from the top of this chart to the bottom. This is just the universe screaming at us to tell us something because there are so many fascinating things about this. Of course, we know we have a lot of hydrogen and helium in the universe, and we know that generally speaking, they're going to die off as we get um, bigger because we're going to be making these things presumably out of these things. So we have less and less of it. But notice here, we've got lithium, beryllium, and boron that are dramatically less abundant than one might expect. According to the general curve, they should be up around here. So that's one thing we've got to explain. One thing that you would have to explain to explain the uh, elemental abundances. We also have out here a peak at iron. Iron is the most common element, uh, uh, metal with the possible exception of magnesium, but it's way higher than we might expect based on this curve. Down here, we have some smaller bumps uh, around uh, 10 element number 50, and then also over here, uh, lead at 82. So all of these things are information that the universe is trying to tell us. And then finally, the most striking thing is the zigzag sawtooth pattern here. The even numbered uh, elements are much more common than their odd numbered neighbors. Neon is way more common than fluorine or sodium, magnesium much more common than sodium or aluminum and so forth. So we have this zigzag that's going on as well. So all of these things are things that we would like to understand about um, how they came about. How did, this, how did this happen? One of the primary properties of a nucleus is how tightly is it bound. Now, naively, we might wonder why they exist at all because nuclei consist of protons. Protons are positively charged. We're cramming them down in this very tiny region of space. Why does that work? Well, it works because there are strong nuclear forces that are available to nucleons, and they're much stronger than electrical forces, and they are, but they're very, very short ranged. So the instant a nucleon gets just a tiny bit away from a nucleus, all it feels at that point is the electrical repulsion, and it flies away. Well, this diagram is the binding energy per nucleon. What do we mean by binding energy? Well, that's the energy it takes to reach into a nucleus, take all the protons and all the neutrons, and separate them out into space. Uh, we can't do that experiment. There's no way we can do that. So it sounds like a difficult thing to do, but actually it's not difficult at all. We know the mass of an individual isolated proton. We know the mass of an individual isolated neutron. It's almost the same. They're, the neutron is slightly more massive. If we calculate the, the mass that we would expect for a nuclide, uh, we get a number right here, and then we can actually go out and experimentally determine the mass of the nuclide with a mass spectrometer, which can get extremely uh, precise masses. And what we inevitably find out is it, the mass of the nuclide is less than the mass of the protons and the neutrons. Ma mass is missing. We call that the mass defect. Well, we know from Einstein equals mc squared. So he told us that energy and mass are two sides of the same coin. So it's relatively easy to use that equation to find that the binding energy is that mass defect multiplied by c squared. Then finally, we got to take into account the, uh, the different sizes. Intuitively, it's going to take a lot more energy to separate out 100 nucleons than it would be just three or four. So we divide by the number of nucleons to get the binding energy per nucleon. That puts it pretty much all in the same, same category. And what we see here is that the light elements are not very well bound. And if we were to take these elements and sm slam them together, we would release energy because the, the energy is on the downhill side. So if we can convert hydrogen into helium, will get, will produce energy. Notice helium, by the way, is a little bit of an oddball here in that it's way more stable than lithium and that's beryllium and boron there. So right away we see a little bit of a hint about why lithium, beryllium and boron are rare 
because they're kind of not bound very well compared to the elements around them. Um, so by combining nuclei on this side, we can release until we eventually get to iron 56. At iron 56, we minimum. You can't get any more energy out of putting neutrons, or I'm sorry, the, the new nuclei together. Beyond iron, if we were to take these nuclei and split them apart into pieces that are about the size of iron, that would also release energy. So we have a situation where uh, fusion of nuclei into one another will produce energy on this side, and that's what stars do, and fission will produce energy it coming from this side, and that's what um, the uranium bombs do. Well, oh, let me go back a second. How do we get from hydrogen to helium? Well, helium is two protons, two neutrons. Presumably, we could think about two protons and two, two neutrons coming together in the same region of space and binding to form a nucleus. That's really unlikely because nuclei, as I said, are very tiny. And even in the densest situations, they are going to miss each other more often than they're going to hit each other. So we don't have a way, we can't just imagine that a bunch of nucleons come together to form a nucleus. We have to have some sort of stepwise procedure to do that. And that's the way we, we start by considering two protons. Protons are red in my world. Um, if, if the energy is high enough, if, the, if, it's, if it's hot enough and they hit each other square on, they might be able to overcome that barrier, and if they do, they form deuterium. Well, that might be a little bit of a surprise because we've got a neutron there. Neutrons are blue in my world. Um, where, did the, where did the neutron come from? Well, it turns out that neutrons and protons are really very similar to one another. They can convert into one another relatively, uh, relatively easily. So that's what's going on here. The main problem is that we've got a positive two charge over here but only a positive one charge over here because the neutron is neutral. We can't destroy charge, we can't create charge. So we, had a, we have to deal with the charge somehow. And in this particular case, it's, uh, the charge is carried by a positron. A positron is the antimatter of an electron. It's exactly like an electron except the opposite. And when, two, uh, when, two, uh, when an electron and positron come together, they completely destroy all the mass of those two particles. And again, by e equals mc squared, we produce, we produce a photon, so, two photons actually. So uh, we're not gonna pay much attention to these. There's also other things going on. There's also energy being released. There are neutrinos and antineutrinos, none of which have anything to do with what we're talking about. So I'm going to completely ignore those. Alternately, if there are neutrons around in the star, a, a neutron can run into a proton and directly form deuterium. So that's the first step. It releases energy, it produces heat and light. But deuterium is a very fragile nuclide. If we look on the, on the table here, we see it's way up here, by far and away the least tightly bound per nucleon of all the, all the nuclides. So that's very fragile. It can be destroyed by heat. Stars can get hot enough to destroy deuterium. So we're gonna to have to find a way to get from deuterium down here to these other things before we're actually gonna be able to get all the way to helium. Well, one thing that can happen is a deuterium can run into a proton. There's an electrostatic repulsion here, but it might be overcomable. Overcomable? You might be able to overcome it. And would form helium-3 two protons, one neutron. The only nuclide in existence where there are more protons than neutrons. Um, uh, if a neutron runs into helium-3, we've made it to helium-4. Another possibility is that the deuterium can run into a neutron, no electrostatic barrier there, and we form an isotope of hydrogen called tritium, two, pro two neutrons, one proton, if that runs into a proton, it can also form helium-3. So that's another pathway. Finally, a, a, another pathway is the, this helium-3. 
remember helium-3 wasn't bound very well, so it's not a very stable nucleus. If two of them run into each other at high enough temperatures, you can get a helium-4 and two protons that can go on and react in other ways. So we found a way for stars, or this is the hypothesized way that stars convert hydrogen into helium, and it produces a massive amount of energy. Well, we've been looking at these things. Let's look at something a little more fun. Let's look at it going on. So here is uh, a star producing um, uh, helium from hydrogen right there, right there, right there. There are a few other places you may notice that going on. Same way with the Sombrero Galaxy. This was in a book by Isaac Asimov, and I, I saw this a long time ago. And I always loved the Sombrero Galaxy. So when I got to see it through the, the telescope in the Virgo Venture a couple of weeks ago, I was, I was just ecstatic. And of course, our good old Andromeda Galaxy. So that's, so that's what's going on in all of these pictures. Conversion of hydrogen into helium producing heat. But it's not particularly fast. This is a pretty slow reaction. A hydrogen will exist, a proton will exist in the core of a star for a long time before it gets converted. So it's a fairly slow process. And here's something that's kind of astonishing. We have a volume, our bodies have a certain volume. We eat food, we breathe oxygen, the oxygen eventually burns the food. So we're producing energy too, just like the sun does. What's astonishing is that a piece of the sun your size is producing 10,000 times less energy than you are. So in a sense, we are more powerful than the stars. Well, I, that's, not, that's not true. They're big. We're not that big. So they get away because they're that big. If we took 10 to the 30th humans and put them into a star or put them into a big circle like a star, if they survived, which they wouldn't, they would burn brighter and hotter than our sun does, but would not burn for nearly as long as our sun does because this is a very slow reaction. Well, going back to this abundance diagram, we've, we kind of have an answer for uh, hydrogen and helium. We've seen that those guys are a little bit odd. When I was uh, 14, 15 years old, I imagined myself to be brilliant. Um, and, and I noticed that carbon, the most stable form of carbon, is essentially three helium nuclei, six protons, six neutrons. The most common form of oxygen, four helium nuclei, five for neon, six for magnesium, seven for, for silicon, uh, eight for sulfur, nine for argon, and 10 for Calcium, it kind of breaks down after that point because as nuclei get bigger, you need more than a one-to-one -one ratio of uh, neutrons to protons. So not only were these things uh, stable nuclei, multiples of this, um, of helium, they're also in most cases, the most common isotope available. Oxygen is mostly oxygen 16, neon is mostly neon 20. The only exception is over here at argon. Argon-36 is a stable nucleus, but the most common uh, form of argon is argon-40. But that's, that's, um, that's, that's a minor, minor point. So in my youth, I thought, well, helium seems to be a really important, kind of a fundamental character. So maybe two heliums bump into each other and form the stable isotope beryllium-8. Beryllium-8 is hit by another helium to form carbon-12. Carbon-12 hits another helium to form oxygen-16, oxygen-16, and so forth. And we can keep on going all the way up to calcium. So this is my brilliant plan. This is how we get, we, this is also how we skip over every other element. Every time a helium goes into a nucleus, it adds two to the number of protons. So we skip over the odd-numbered guys. Well, I was pretty sure at this point I was going to win the Nobel Prize. And um, I sat around my room thinking about what I would say at my Stockholm speech and so forth. 
actually, who are we kidding? I was just thinking about how easy it would be to pick up chicks if I had a Nobel Prize thing hanging around my neck. Then the ax fell. That reaction doesn't work. Beryllium is not the most stable form of, of uh, beryllium-8 is not the most form, uh, stable form of beryllium. Beryllium-8 is unstable. In fact, it's extremely unstable. It has a half-life of about 10 to the minus 17th seconds. It's way, way shorter than even some of the most rapidly decaying nuclei. And the only stable isotope of beryllium is nine. Why it needs that extra neutron, I do not know. Well, this crushed me. I, I, I never, I've never really recovered from all of this. It, it, uh, I hate beryllium to this day. I, 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 I think beryllium ought to simply be dismissed uh, away from the periodic table. So in a, with beryllium forming this barrier, this, in a, this, this, this uh, preventing us from getting to these other things, this is our periodic table, not too impressive. In fact, the chemistry that would come out of this table is ridiculous. Helium has no chemistry whatsoever. Hydrogen can form a molecule with other hydrogens. H2, that's the form of hydrogen in, at room temperature. I suppose we could have hydrogen run into helium to form lithium hydride. That is really a compound. And it is possible in certain circumstances to get two lithiums to form uh, dilithium, which of course is how the USS Enterprise is powered. But that's it. That's all the chemistry we have in this universe. Beryllium has deprived us of everything we need. Well, I think beryllium really blew its chance. I know, I know I'm really getting on beryllium's case here, but I really hate that element. It had a chance. It had a chance to be really uh, amazing. It could have been along with carbon and oxygen and so forth. Beryllium-8 could have been right up there in the abundance scale. It could have been prominent, but it isn't. It has the other advantages as well. BE, the only element in the periodic table that is a verb, B, unless you count molybdenum here as mu, but it's not really. That's, so beryllium had a chance to be a star. In fact, if you put an exclamation mark behind beryllium, you have what could be used as an athletic shoe slogan. Uh, this would be the Zen-like answer to just do it by Nike. You don't have to do it, just be. But it, it wouldn't work now because everybody would look at that and say, hey, isn't beryllium that element that required that extra neutron? I don't, I don't want to have anything to do with that. So, so somehow we have to find a way around that. It can only be what can be, that's right. <laughs> okay. Well, there is a way around it. I'll, I'll, I'll um, not keep you in suspense any longer. It does, we do get around that. We do exist. There is a universe beyond those things. And it happens when two heliums interact with each other. They don't bond but they do form some sort of weird resonance state. They stick around each other just a little longer than they should. It's like two dogs passing each other. They can either completely pass each other or they can stop to sniff each other's butts a little bit, in which case they'll be there a little longer and they'll go other way. Well, helium, these two helium atoms or nuclei are sniffing each other's butts. And while they're doing so, they're, they're there for about 10 to the minus 17th seconds. But if there were no uh, resonant state, they would be only there in, in proximity for about 10 to the minus 21 seconds. So they, it, it, that little resonance gives us about a 10,000 fold increase of the probability of another alpha part, another uh, helium particle hitting. And that's, we have a three membered collision that doesn't happen very often, it's very rare. Uh, but if we do that, we form carbon. We get past beryllium and form carbon. Um, it has to be really hot to do that, about uh, at least in the hundred millions of degrees. And we also have to have a lot of helium presence. So it only happens in a star that's produced a lot of helium. 
because if there's a lot of helium, there's more chance that three of them will come together like this. But once we've, in, once we've found carbon, it's off to the races. This is proto-life. Carbon has life written all over it. And this is where I'm going to go on my flight of fancy because as a chemist, I'm going to talk about how brilliantly carbon changes the universe. Carbon has a special ability to bind with other carbon atoms, no matter what that other carbon atom might be bound to. So we can build successively larger structures of, of carbon and some other elements as well. Uh, here's some examples, ethanol. Now here I'm coming back to molecular size. So these uh, uh, space filling models are trying to show the entire atom. So these are the electron clouds that we're trying to picture here. Uh, the nucleus is a very tiny, maybe one pixel down there. So we're not talking about nuclei any longer for, for at least a few minutes. We also can form aspirin. The red balls are oxygen, which bonds very nicely to carbon. We can form nicotine. The blue balls are uh, nitrogen. Did I say these were oxygen? Yeah, these are nitrogen. Uh, THC, tetrahydrocannabinol. Don't judge, it's legal now in Minnesota. Uh, we also have LSD, lysergic acid diethylamide, and heroin. Okay, you can probably judge now. But this is just showing you the, the astonishingly um, beautiful ways carbon can form molecules. I mentioned the carbon, two, the two carbons bonded here. Here's a six-membered ring of carbon. It forms that very easily and it's very stable. Here's a six-membered ring, but there's a nitrogen in place of one of the carbon. That can happen too. We could also put an oxygen there as well, not in this particular case, but in other cases. Um, we have rings that have decorations. Here's a six-membered ring with a five-carbon chain coming off of it. Um, here is a spectacular example in LSD. There's a six-membered ring. There's a five-membered ring that share these two carbon atoms. So the two rings are fused and we have a hetero atom there. Moreover, if you look carefully, there's another six-membered ring right here. So this carbon is not only a member of that ring and that ring, it's a matter of member of that ring as well. So carbon has insanely large number of possibilities of things it can do. Well, how versatile is it really? Yeah, I know what you're thinking. Is he still talking about carbon? But yeah, I'm still talking about carbon. There is a program which one can run that'll take in uh, a number of total uh, atoms of carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. And this group did ran this program with 17 carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. That's a pretty small molecule by, by uh, carbon standards. And then we, have, we assume we have enough hydrogen to fill up all the chemical valences. So they ran this program to determine how many stable carbon, nitrogen oxygen compounds there could be with 17 of those atoms, 166 billion combinations. That's how versatile carbon is. We have created about 60 million compounds and that's way beyond with 17 carbon nitrogen oxygens. So we've sampled less than one out of two or 3,000 of the compounds that can be even for that tiny number of nitrogen uh, carbon, nitrogen, and oxygens. This calculation took over 100,000 hours on an IBM 360 computer. So we're not likely very soon to find out what this number would be if that number, if the 17 was 20 or 25 or 1,000. Obviously that number is going to go into truly astronomical size. Well, carbon can do these wonderful things. And here's another example. Hemoglobin. This the hemoglobin at molecule, which takes oxygen from our lungs to our muscles, so it can burn, be used to burn fuels, has 10,000 atoms in it. 7,000 of them are carbon, nitrogen, and oxygen. So imagine what the number of possibilities would be if you could run that program 
or 7,000 carbon, nitrogen, and oxygens. Hemoglobin is a protein. Here's another protein, amylase, and another protein, protease. These are proteins which um, cause chemical reactions to happen faster than they would otherwise. Um, starch comes as a very long string of glucose units. It's polyglucose, essentially. We need glucose. We burn glucose. But we can't burn an entire string. We have to have something that chops the, the, the thing up. And that's what this does. And that's probably why it has this little architectural feature of a little slot here and kind of a hole there. That gives a space that the starch molecule can be, would be attracted to. And then by some mechanism, once it's bound to that protein, the protein does a little shift and it snaps off a glucose unit. This molecule, protease, does the same thing with proteins. Uh, again, there are little uh, clefts and valleys here. So this is all just to show you how astonishingly uh, um, amazing carbon can be. Here's another example, DNA. A lot of carbons in here, a lot of oxygens as well. DNA is a fairly complicated molecule. Well, you probably, it's a double helix. This is a tiny little section of it. On this scale, if we showed the entire molecule, it would go off 20,000 miles in this direction and 20,000 miles in this direction. That's according to my calculation. And I could be wrong because remember only 75% of my brain is, is still working. But it shows you how, how, again, another demonstration of the mastery of carbon. And furthermore, this molecule is important because it can contain everything that needs to be known about how to build a living system. Well, the, the, the race of life, small carbon compounds that are deposited in the cold state regions of space where the sun's far from the suns, small carbon compounds and bigger carbon compounds, bigger carbon compounds eventually will find a way to reproduce themselves, to make copies of themselves. And there is life. Life creates more compounds. Of the compounds I showed earlier, uh, almost all of them were made by living systems. In fact, at one time, the chemistry of carbon, which is called organic chemistry, it was thought that life was an essential thing for making it. it didn't, we didn't think it was possible to make a, an organic compound without starting with something that life uh, created. That turns out not to be quite true, but it was believed for a long time. Uh, life goes on to create... Uh, uh, the, the, the carbon compounds that some life creates, creates uh, things that even more life can use, can eat. And finally, the universe interacts with life. Again, all due to the ability of carbon to do all these wonderful things, it, it, the universe interacts with life and, and it's, it, we create molecules uh, that enable us to see the universe, to hear it, and to taste and smell it. For example, here's a protein called rhodopsin. It will interact with a, another compound, 11-cis-retinol. Uh, That's a big version. This is what it looks like more on this scale. This will bind with this in some way that I'm not going to specify because I don't know. Um, here is trans-retinol. It turns out that when you hit this thing bound to this with a photon, the kink that's in cis-retinol is smoothed out and forms trans-retinol. Somehow, somehow, that change in geometry, that straightening out, sends a signal through this entire protein complex, which produces an electrical signal, which goes to our brains, and that is where we get eyes. So, Here's some eyes. I think eyes are extraordinarily beautiful things. It's like the universe is telling us, I just love seeing myself because I made these organs that I made to see myself with are just gorgeous. Well, the universe, universe also has gases which can be rarefied uh, in waves and uh, rarefied and compressed in waves. Same thing with water and that 
gives us hearing. So we get a variety of ears that are available. Some big ones, some small ones, all doing pretty much the same thing. Same thing with taste, tongues, and noses are all based on the idea that certain portions of a living creature can have uh, receptors that react to the shape of a molecule. The shape of glucose, for some reason, when it hits our taste buds, sends a signal that says sweet. So carbon enables not only the proliferation of all these things, but enables the universe to be able to see itself. And not only uh, does, it, is it, does this DNA manage to encapsulate all the information necessary to create something like this puppy here, it gives us the, the ability to break that thing apart, replace it with other pieces, rebuilding the DNA molecule. So with the same parents, you can get some surprises. Uh, there are the puppies and kitties I promised. So with this variation, this ability to get better and better and better, uh, carbon allows us to build animals that are fast, faster, big, even bigger and smaller. This is, uh, this is I think, a meerkat. And it's thought that uh, our, our ancestors back in the uh, Cretaceous, Triassic, Jurassic period actually evolved to become smaller so we could hide in tinier spaces and stay out of the jaws of the, of the dinosaurs. Um, this ability has led to str strength, ridiculous, uh, garish strength and strength that's not so garish but is even stronger than in the previous slide and here we have the strongest we have all these animals all these animals have is a result of of uh, all of this conversion of carbon night flowing from one place to another does it happen on europa maybe there's a big sea maybe there's a liquid ocean underneath that ice shell wouldn't we just love to know if there is life there? Is it based on DNA? Is the DNA like our DNA or is it something different? Because if it's like our DNA, that means that DNA is not just a global phenomenon, it's a universal phenomenon. Animals learn to fly in the air, fly in the water, walk on six, uh, eight legs, excuse me, four legs, two legs. Um, let's call it a hundred legs. And well, that's, that's a thousand legs, I think. Or no legs at all. Eventually animals start to learn to use tools like this bird using a twig to get uh, insects. Or this otter uh, putting stones on his tummy in order to, to open up crabs. Eventually, eventually th this, this constant change, this constant flux, which is still going on, Something somewhere stands up and says, looks around, looks at the sky, looks, looks at the, uh, around him and says, what the hell is going on here? Isn't it, isn't it nice to think that maybe somewhere in the universe, uh, it created a Gumby physiology with a, uh, an angry Eddie Murphy face? Well, once this question is asked, we have science, we have literature, we have music, we have all of these, these brilliant insights into things. This, this picture may not be as familiar to you. This is Dr. Jennifer Duada, who pioneered a technique of taking these DNA molecules and able to replace certain sections of it. In other words, if DNA is producing a defective being, she found a way to edit that so that it would produce uh, a good being. So that's terrifying, but it's also very hopeful. At some point, this face may be as or more famous than that. Well, I've digressed here. Let's go back to nucleosynthesis. We have this much of the periodic table. That's a lot. Almost everything that we need on a day to day basis is here. Things that are missing are gold, so we wouldn't have that. Um, but we'd still have precious jewels. Almost all the uh, things that are 
precious and semi-precious jewels are made out of silicon and oxygen and a few other things. Diamonds are exclusively carbon. Another, another brilliant stroke of uh, engineering from carbon. So how do we get beyond that? Well, suppose we have an iron 56. That's right at the bottom of the well. And suppose there's a flux of neutrons. So a neutron hits it, forms iron 57, still stable. Another neutron hits that, iron 58, still stable. Another one hits iron 58. Iron 59 is not stable. It has too many neutrons. Once, a, once a, 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 a nucleus has too many neutrons, it tends to convert a neutron into a proton. And it has to release an electron to keep the charge balanced. But we've advanced from one part of the periodic table to the next element, cobalt 59. If that absorbs a neutron, it's, it will form cobalt 60, which is unstable and will decay with beta emission to form nickel 60. More neutrons, we get up to nickel, uh, what is that, uh, 63, that's unstable, and it goes up to the next element, copper. Uh, copper can absorb a neutron to form copper 64, that decays to form zinc. So you see we're, we're just stepping our way through the entire periodic table. As long as we have, a good flux of neutrons. Now these are all, this is all very theoretical, certain experiments we could do on Earth, but by and large, we, can't, we cannot reach out into a star and actually determine what's going there. So this is, this is all hypothesized, but it explains, it explains uh, circumstances very well. This is called the, R, the slow series, because uh, every time a neutron hits um, uh, a nucleus and is absorbed, that nucleus has a chance to do something. So at this point, that nucleus has a half-life such that it eventually turns into cobalt and so forth. Maybe this happens, probably this happens in red giants. Well, I mentioned red giants. Let's take a look at a red giant because we like these kinds of pictures. Uh, can't really see a red giant very well. So we've got an artist impersonate or an artist interpretation here. The artists include the sun here just to keep us humble but Betelgeuse, am, am I right? Who, it gets dimmer, it gets, it gets brighter. Who here doesn't want to see it turn into, okay, who here doesn't want to see it turn into uh, a supernova? Even if it wipes out a civilization or two, we want to see it turn into a supernova. Well, there's another way that we can build these up. Um, suppose we have a situation in a star where there's suddenly a tremendous flux of neutrons. So instead of each daughter nucleus being able to react to the new situation, it, it just more and more neutrons get piled into it. I've showed it stopping here at iron 56, but there's no reason to stop here. That's just an example. It could go on to iron 75, iron 82. It doesn't matter. If the, proto if the neutron flux is high enough, it'll, they'll just keep adding on. Once the flux slows down a little bit, there will be a series of beta decay until we eventually get to uh, a nucleus where the balance of neutrons and protons are more, are more similar. And then that can continue right up there. This is thought to happen in supernovas. And probably happened here, the Crab Nebula. All of this stuff was ejected from the star during the explosion. Right in the center of this is a little neutron star. So, so that's how we get the rest of the periodic table. But one thing that uh, is odd is that even the oldest stars, we've got 10 to 15 minutes for you. Okay, can you give me a, uh, you know, 920? Okay, I should be done by then. Even the oldest stars are 25% helium. So far in the entire universe, stars have turned 1% of the hydrogen into helium, 1%. But the oldest stars still have 25% helium. So what's going on here? Well, it's gotta be the Big Bang. First few seconds of the universe, uh, Georges uh, Lemaitre said that it was a day without a yesterday. He had the idea that the Big Bang was a gigantic nucleus that split into pieces. 
not exactly right, but it's still an interesting idea. The, uh, the early universe was about a billion times smaller. And by that, I don't mean that, that this matter in it was, was all compressed down into a tiny little corner of it. What I mean is that the entire universe consisted of that tiny little space. All that there was in terms of being was a billion times smaller. The temperature is very much like a star, about 3 billion degrees. The density is about uh, 10, gram, 10 grams per cubic centimeter. That's about 100 times the density of water and about nine times the density of lead. So this is not terribly dense, really, on a cosmological scale. So what was the composition? Well, the composition of the Big Bang changed dramatically over very tiny periods of, uh, periods of time. But at least at one point, for every one neutron, there were seven protons, seven electrons, and about a billion photons. So at this point, almost all the energy of the universe was tied up in electromagnetic radiation and light. There was just a little bit of it that had crystallized out into protons uh, and, and, uh, and neutrons. That seven to one ratio is really important because that auto almost automatically gives us the answer. Here we have seven protons and a neutron, another seven protons, another neutron. These things can go through the same kind of reactions we saw in stars, and eventually two protons and two neutrons form a, form a helium. What are the masses? Well, let's just, the mass of a proton and neutron are very near one another, so let's just say the mass is one. In those protons, we have a mass of 12, and in the helium, we have a mass of four, that's a three to one ratio or 75% hydrogen, 25% helium. So it falls right out. Here is a great example that I, a uh, great diagram that I stole from Dr. Whittle. It shows the first hour of the Big Bang. Notice that along here we have time in exponential, so 10 to, a, 10 to 100 to 1,000. Here we also have an exponential scale. Well, at about 15 seconds or so, we're starting to form a deuterium from protons reacting. At about a minute, we're starting to see some helium there. Not very much, because remember the scale is very compressed. At about, uh, let's see, this is probably about, uh, I don't know what's, anyway, it's a little bit longer. It's still, it's still less than a minute. Uh, no, still, still less than an hour. We're getting more and more helium. And finally, by the time we reach about, uh, that's probably about, uh, about 10 minutes, I think. It's hard to read these logarithmic scales. I just like them for that. At that point, it pretty much shuts down. All the high helium that's gonna form has already been formed. The deuterium's on its way out. Neutrons are disappearing into helium nuclei, so they're nose diving. There's a tiny little bit of lithium here. Let's think about this for a second. What this means is in over a period of just a few seconds, more hydrogen was converted into helium than suns have done since the Big Bang in all the galaxies, all the stars in the last 13 and a half billion years. Well, that's pretty much it. We now understand all the matter in the universe. I left a few details out, but that's pretty much it. Except for the 95% that we don't know what is. You probably know that by the way galaxies rotate, we can determine that one of two things is true. Either we don't understand gravity very well, or there's a lot more mass out there that we can't see. And that's called dark matter and dark energy. I'm, that's something for another topic. I do have uh, the leading contender right now uh, of what this is comes from Douglas Adams in a scientific paper, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, in which he says that the astronomers knew that this matter was out here, but they couldn't find it. So they bought bigger uh, uh, telescopes, they unpacked it, set them up, still couldn't find it. Bought even bigger telescopes, set them up, couldn't find it. Over and over and over, they, they set up telescopes until someone finally realized that the missing matter was all the packing material that the telescopes came in. I don't know if that's right or not, but it sure, it sure makes a good story. Well, thank you very much. I've really enjoyed this, uh, uh, this uh, 
being able to give this talk to you. Wonderful. Yeah, if, if you have questions, I'll try to answer them. If I can't answer them, I'm a pretty glib liar, so. Right. Uh, oh. Any questions? So you may have touched on this a little bit, but it's an important point of your presentation is, so in the biggest stars, mm -hmm. uh, as they're burning through all their fuel, they get to iron. Right. And then, so stars are basically the outward pressure force created by nuclear fusion, counteracted by gravity, right? Right. So they hit the iron and they can no longer produce that pressure force. Right. Why is that? There's no more energy to be had. Um, it can't produce any more heat. It can't produce any more pressure from that point on. That's, that's the best answer I can give. Uh, once you hit iron, nothing else can happen to produce the heat that's going to produce the pressure to keep everything from collapsing in. That's, that's my best answer. Other questions? Okay, my apologies for being a little bit late tonight, but uh, I sure have enjoyed this. I hope you have too. No problem. Matt, was there any questions online? All right, perfect. Okay. Thank you very much.